Good afternoon and welcome to Occidental's second quarter 2024 earnings conference call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Jordan Tanner, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Drew. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for participating in Occidental's second quarter 2024 earnings conference call. On the call with us today are Vicki Holub, President and Chief Executive Officer, Sunil Matthew, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, Richard Jackson, President of Operations, U.S. Onshore Resources and Carbon Management, and Ken Dillon, Senior Vice President and President, International Oil and Gas Operations. This afternoon, we will refer to slides available on the investor section of our website. The presentation includes a cautionary statement on slide two regarding forward-looking statements that will be made on the call this afternoon. We'll also reference a few non-GAAP financial measures today. Reconciliations to the nearest corresponding GAAP measure can be found in the schedules to our earnings release and on our website. I will now turn the call over to Vicki. Thank you, Jordan, and good afternoon, everyone. I'll begin today by highlighting another quarter of exceptional ex execution across our business segment. Our teams delivered strong operational performance during the second quarter. Our technical and operational excellence, paired with a high-quality asset portfolio, continued to deliver value across our businesses. Last week, we further strengthened our portfolio through the addition of Crown Rocks assets in the Midland Basin. We were also pleased to announce that our strategic divestiture program is progressing and we have clear line of sight to meeting the debt reduction targets we set out when we announced the deal last December. This afternoon, I'll cover our second quarter results and operational performance, as well as our Crown Rock integration plans. Sunil will then review our financial results and guidance, including an increase in full year guidance for our midstream earnings. In the second quarter, we delivered Oxy's highest quarterly production in four years for both total company and U.S. onshore. This exceeds the midpoint of total company production guidance generating $1.3 billion in free cash flow before working capital. This was driven by exceptional execution across our business segments with notably strong Permian new well performance and higher production uptime, along with outperformance in the Gulf of Mexico. We're exceeding our production expectations for onshore new wells across all our basins and are continuing to achieve operational efficiencies as we execute our capital program. This year to date, we've seen approximately 10% improvement in our unconventional well cost compared to the first half of last year, putting us ahead of our planned well cost savings. These savings have been achieved through lower non-productive time, increased frac utilization, operational efficiency gains, and facilities optimization as part of our focused program to lower well cost, decrease time to market, and increase free cash flow. We anticipate further acceleration in time to market in the second half of the year. Importantly, we continue to, de to deliver industry-leading performance and secondary bench development, supporting long-term economics and inventory replenishment. The momentum we are generating on development cost across many facets should translate to capital efficiency improvements as we look toward the, the end of the year and into 2025. In addition to improved capital efficiency and continued well-performance leadership, our teams have driven down lease operating expenses across our domestic assets to enhance our cash margins. In the second quarter, our per BOE lease operating expenses decreased over 60 cents a barrel, a 6% improvement relative to the average of the prior three quarters. We have several more optimization initiatives planned for the second half of the year, which should give us a favorable outlook toward year end. For example, in our Permian EOR business, we are finding ways to utilize CO2 more efficiently in our reservoirs. We're also optimizing our artificial lift. 
which has led to reduced failure rates and associated downhole maintenance costs. In the Delaware Basin, we've decreased water disposal costs by doubling the volume of water recycles relative to the first half of last year. Water stewardship remains a key priority in our operations, and I'm pleased to highlight a recent milestone in which we recycled a cumulative 50 million barrels in our Midland South Curtis Ranch treatment facility. In addition, we have now recycled over 150 million barrels in our New Mexico operations since, since 2019. Overall, we have built solid oil and gas segment momentum as we move into the second half of 2024. This gives us confidence to maintain our full year production guidance, excluding around Crown Rock, for our total company and Permian assets, despite the expected divestiture of 15,000 DOE per day in the fourth quarter. Our midstream business significantly outperformed in the second quarter with an adjusted pre-tax income more than $180 million higher than the, than the guidance midpoint. Our domestic gas marketing teams followed up on the success of their first quarter by utilizing this their extensive market intelligence and transportation capability to benefit from regional pricing dislocations. Furthermore, as healthy storage levels and stable Permian output continued from earlier in the year, the second quarter presented abnormally high planned and unplanned maintenance on takeaway pipelines. Our teams capitalized on this opportunity, highlighting the value the diversity of our asset base provides. As we look ahead to the second half of the year, we anticipate fewer opportunities for optimization after the Matterhorn pipeline is placed in service, which is expected in the coming months. However, our teams will be prepared to act if additional bottlenecks arise. Looking now at our low-carbon businesses, we're excited by the advancements we're making. As construction of Stratus, our first direct air capture facility, moves forward, our low carbon ditchers team continues to demonstrate that demand for carbon dioxide removal credits is growing. In July, we announced an agreement with Microsoft for the sale of 500,000 metric tons of CDR credits over six years from Stratos. The agreement is the largest single purchase of direct air capture CDR credits to date and highlights the increasing recognition of carbon engineering's technology as a solution to help organizations achieve their net zero goals. I would now like to talk about how pleased we are to integrate Crown Rock into the greater Oxy portfolio. We closed the acquisition on August 1st, and we continue to be impressed with Crown Rock's efficient operations and employee talent. As we have discussed previously, this acquisition complements and enhances our premier Permian portfolio with the addition of high margin production and low break even undeveloped inventory. We are excited about the subsurface and geologic potential of these assets, and our technical teams are eager to apply their subsurface expertise and workflows to generate maximum value. We're also looking forward to leveraging our newfound scale in the Midland Basin. Over the years, we've seen how scale has driven significant technical advancements and operational efficiencies in our other basins. We're confident that as we integrate our Midland Basin assets, we'll unlock meaningful efficiencies through infrastructure sharing, resource utilization, and by bringing together best practices from each of our organizations. Our combined teams have made great strides in the past several days getting to know each other and integrating Crown Rock into Oxy's organization. On our next call, we're looking forward to telling you more about our post-Crown Rock enhanced portfolio and how the integration is advancing. One of the many benefits of this acquisition was the opportunity to high-grade Oxy's existing portfolio of assets. In December, we laid out plans for a $4.5 to $6 billion divestiture program to be completed within 18 months of the acquisition's close. Given the inventory depth of our onshore por portfolio, we welcome the opportunity to monetize some of these assets at an attractive price. And as we announced last week, the divestiture program is progressing well. Since the start of the year, we have closed or announced a approximately $1 a billion dollars of Permian Basin divestitures. The proceeds from these sales will go directly toward debt reduction. This progress on divestitures coupled with a robust organic cash flow underpinned by our steady focus on operational excellence has positioned us well to reduce our debt in the near term. Sunil will address this in more detail, but we're excited that we're on track to retire approximately $3 billion of debt during the second, third quarter, which means 
which speaks to both the quality of our assets and our future cash, cash flow potential. Now I'll hand the call over to Sunil to provide more details about our second quarter financial results, our guidance, and progress on strategic financial action. Thank you, Vicky. We are excited with the recent progress we have made in executing the portfolio grading plan we outlined in December. Oxy has realized an immediate announcement of a U.S. onshore portfolio with low break-even inventory and expansion of free cash flow generation potential upon the closing of Crown Rock last week. The opportunity to build scale in the Midland Basin made this transaction a strategic fit for Oxy and the newly acquired assets will immediately compete for capital. In late July, we issued $5 billion of senior unsecured notes. We used the net proceeds of the offering and term loans to fund the cash consideration of the Crown Rock acquisition. Overall, we were highly pleased with the investor demand for the bond offering. We placed notes maturing in five branches at three, five, long seven, 10, and 30 years at a weighted average coupon rate of less than 5.5%, creating a manageable debt maturity profile given our deleveraging plans. Our efforts to strengthen our balance sheet remain a top priority, and we are achieving early success in debt reduction. In July, we retired $400 million of debt at maturity, and our strong organic free cash flow is enabling further deleveraging progress in the coming weeks. By the end of August, between additional oxy maturities and the early redemption of Crown Rock's notes, we will have repaid an additional $1.9 billion of debt, bringing the total to $2.3 billion. Add to this the proceeds from the Barilla Draw divestiture, and we expect to have repaid over $3 billion in debt by the end of the third quarter, which is almost 70% of our near-term reduction commitment of $4.5 billion. We will continue to prudently advance deleveraging via free cash flow and proceeds from our divestiture program. We were pleased last week to announce the agreement to sell certain Delaware Basin assets for approximately $818 million. The core of this divestiture centers around approximately 27,500 net acres in the Barilla Draw field of the Texas Delaware Basin. While these assets have been go to Oxy's southern Delaware position for over a decade, the remaining inventory is longer dated in our current development plans. We anticipate closing the sale late in the third quarter and estimate a 15,000 BOE per day reduction in fourth quarter Permian production. Separate from this transaction, we also announced additional completed dispositions from earlier in the year involving several smaller undeveloped acreage positions throughout the Permian, approximately $152 million in total. This brings total year-to-date closed or announced divestments to $970 million. Consistent with our cash flow priorities, all net proceeds from these sales will be allocated to debt reduction. We are satisfied with the progress of our divestiture program and the trajectory of debt reduction plans. We are ahead of schedule on our near-term debt reduction commitments, and we will continue to focus on strengthening our balance sheet through a combination of divestitures and excess cash flow until we reach our principal debt target of $15 billion or less. In the second quarter, we generated both an adjusted and reported profit of $1.03 per diluted share and exited the second quarter with $1.8 billion of unrestricted cash. As Vicky highlighted earlier, we generated over $1.3 billion of free cash flow before working capital, driven by sustained success across our diversified business segments. Most specifically, the second quarter was marked by strong production performance in the Permian and Gulf of Mexico, driving high oil volumes. In the midstream seg segment, substantial value capture was realized, particularly in gas marketing 
as evident through the greater than $180 million adjusted pre-tax income outperformance when compared to the midpoint of guidance. We are delighted with how operational excellence drove financial results in the second quarter and continue to benefit from a complementary asset base that positions us for success through a wide range of pricing environments. Our second quarter capital was largely in line with the first quarter, consistent with our business plan of a front half AV year and domestic oil and gas activity. We reported a negative working capital change in the second quarter, primarily due to higher oil volumes and increased barrel shipments on the water at quarter end. Rockies related property tax payments, which are based on a two year revenue lag and incorporates a period of higher oil and nat- higher oil and natural gas prices from 2022 also played a contributing factor. Now looking ahead to the second half of 2024, we have provided performa guidance based upon the following assumptions. We included Crown Rock in our guidance beginning August 1st, and we excluded from guidance the 15,000 BOE per day of 4Q production associated with the permanent divestment as we expect the transaction to close late in the third quarter. Even after adjusting for this disposition, Oxy's total and Permian Fulia production, excluding Crown Rock, is expected to remain flat due to higher Permian outlook. Including Crown Rock, the midpoint of our total company production guidance has increased from 1.25 million to approximately 1.32 million BOE per day. Building on the operational momentum generated in the first and second quarters, we anticipate an improving production trajectory in the back half of the year in all our domestic assets. This includes the Gulf of Mexico, even after incorporating some downtime for potential disruptive tropical weather in our guidance. Excluding Crown Rock, the midpoint of our 3Q production guidance would represent a new record for the highest quarterly production in over four years. In the appendix, we have summarized some of the key full-year guidance changes associated with consolidating Crown Rock into our portfolio. Aside from the production benefits, we anticipate a notable improvement in domestic operating costs from adding these high-margin barrels. Excluding Crown Rock, we are also pleased with Oxy's improvement and favorable trajectory of operating costs and capital efficiency across our U.S. onshore assets, as highlighted by Vicky earlier. Oxychem's 2024 business is performing well, with results largely in line with the plan we laid out at the start of the year. However, challenging economic conditions in China, combined with the continued deferral of interest rate reductions, have dampened Oxychem's trajectory for the year. As a result, we are revising Oxychem's full-year guidance down to a range of $1 to $1.1 billion. We continue to anticipate that 2024 will be another strong year for Oxychem by historical standards. With midstream and marketing strong second quarter, we have raised full-year guidance by $220 million. We anticipate a more muted third quarter as additional Permian gas takeaway capacity is expected to come online, reducing gas marketing optimization opportunities. We continue to execute our 2024 capital program as scheduled. While the legacy Oxy capital will decrease in the second half as a result of tapered domestic activity, maintaining Crown Rock's five rig program will reshape the investment profile as we increase the full year total company net capital range to 6.8 to $7 billion. In closing, I want to discuss how Oxy is delivering on the financial milestones we laid out in December. A sustainable and growing dividend is the foundation of our shareholder return priorities. Earlier this year, we followed through on a commitment we made when we announced the Crown Rock acquisition and raised our quarterly common dividend by over 22%. The free cash flow accretion that we anticipate from Crown Rock, along with the expected improvements from our non-oil and gas segments of our portfolio, 
provided us with the confidence to raise the dividend. Maintaining our investment-grade credit rating is a key priority. In recent weeks, we received ratings affirmations from all three ratings agencies, including our investment-grade credit ratings from Moody's and Fitch. We are focused on our deleveraging strategy, and we remain on track to retire at least $4.5 billion of debt well before next August. We are off to a promising start with our divestiture program. We will continue to evaluate our high-quality asset portfolio for divestment opportunities and will apply those proceeds to further debt reduction, thereby strengthening our balance sheet. Oxy is methodically delivering on these key financial commitments. The strategic and financial actions we have taken over recent quarters are converging to benefit our portfolio, increase cash flow generation capability, and ultimately accelerate shareholder value. I will now turn the call back over to Vicky. Thank you, Sunil. Before we move on to the Q&A, I would like to close by focusing on a few of Oxy's differentiated value catalysts. Our subsurface expertise, technical excellence, and operational strength allow us to continuously achieve basin-leading well performance while simultaneously driving efficiency and savings. The addition of Crown Rock further enhances what I believe is Oxy's strongest portfolio in our century-long history, and it kicks off another phase of Oxy's cash flow growth with future upside through improved resource recovery and lower cost opportunities. I can't wait to see the value that the newly combined teams deliver given the quality and depth of development opportunities coming with this new asset. Beyond oil and gas, we expect our Oxycan and midstream businesses to continue to provide material cash flow durability in the years ahead. And finally, LCV continues to develop practical decarbonization solutions that are solidifying our leadership in this important emerging market. These businesses together position Oxy's common shareholders to benefit financially for decades to come. We will now open the call for questions. As Jordan mentioned, Richard Jackson and Ken Dillon are on the call with us today for the Q&A session. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please limit yourself to one primary question and one follow-up. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. The first question comes from Neil Mehta with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Good, good morning, Vicki and team, and uh, good progress here on uh, on deleveraging. That's kind of where I want to start. Um, recognize the Barilla draw announcement here a couple days ago, but uh, you know, what's the asset sale market look like, and can you talk about the opportunity set to continue to make progress? On, uh, on monetization. Yeah, the um, you know, as you know, we have a deep inventory of um, of assets, and our p- portfolio is very very strong. And I, you know, I certainly appreciate your interest in the details, but we feel like talking in detail about what the assets would be uh, would compromise our ability to maximize the value of those divestitures. Yeah, we've said previously that, that we get a lot of incoming offers, but it's clear that some think that. This is a fire sale, and it is not. Uh, This acquisition has actually enabled us to improve our inventory quality and scale, which provides us now the opportunity to bring forward value. And that's what we did with this Crown Rock uh, acquisition. It's not that the assets that we just sold weren't, um, as Sunil said, a part of our core for 10 years. It's that we knew that we needed to bring forward the value to our shareholders and we did it in a way that makes our inventory stronger, so it was the best possible way to do it. But in terms of talking about um, the other assets, I can just assure you that we have high confidence that we're going to be able to achieve our, our debt reduction targets. And as you saw and as you mentioned, uh, it was definitely we're off to a good start, and we, um, we're excited about where we're headed with this and think that um, certainly the $15 billion that we um, – our targeting to achieve is doable by the end of uh, 2026 or first of 2027, as we've previously said. 
Thanks, Vicki. And then just to follow up on, uh, on the Crown Rock acquisition, uh, just building off slide 27, just your early thoughts, recognizing you're going to give us more next quarter on um, you know, potential synergies and thoughts about the production profile. I, I know you had talked about this being a 170,000 barrel a day asset, and, and the guide is a little softer this, than that, but recognize that uh, it's not a full year and you haven't done your hands full on these assets. So you're just your perspective on on the production profile and the synergies associated with that. Now, bearing in mind that uh, with the SEC rules and regs, our teams have had the opportunity to get together and to, to talk, but not to dive into the details or their plans. And so we've had now just a week for uh, the team to, to start looking at uh, where the, what the situation is now with Crown Rock. And we're, again, incredibly excited about the assets but, um, but I think Richard's team, you, you have found some, some additional details that, that have differentiated what we were expecting versus what, what um, happened over the past couple of quarters. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thanks, Vicki. And I'll try to answer this question in a, in a couple of pieces. I'll start with sort of where we're at today. And like Vicki said, I guess the first thing to say, just very excited to uh, work with our new team and was able to spend some time, you know, after close, uh, you know, in the last week with them and, you know, everything that, that we thought they would be, they are, and, and very excited about uh, really the opportunity. So the first part, I'll kind of address where we are, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and speak uh, to some of the synergies and how we're thinking about that generally. And then as I think we said in our prepared remarks, we'll have more updates, I think, as we go into the end of the year. So so where we where we start, Again, uh, this plan started, you know, with the rules that uh, uh, Crown Rock uh, really had a 2024 plan that they constructed. We, um, you know, didn't have a lot of insight to that. And so we've spent time kind of understanding where, where we are um, and, you know, uh, uh, lots of positives. Uh, the, the upsides that, uh, that we saw not only in a one-year program but longer term still see but as we think about that 170 and our latest guidance, and we're able to talk to the team, a couple of things. One, uh, like us, had some uh, downtime due to some weather events early in the year and uh, just some other operational downtime that, that uh, was a part of that. I'd call it more uh, singular events than ongoing. Um, and then, you know, the, the majority is really well mixed. I think um, due to their development plans and trying to optimize returns, you know, beyond just this year that they, um, you know, really focused on some shallower uh, zones that were a bit uh, tighter spaced uh, and even a little less horizontal length. And so, you know, there are different reasons they constructed the program today versus what we uh, had originally uh, had in our plan. So we'll, uh, we're in the process of deconstructing that. But again, we see that same upside as we roll this forward. I would say it was more delayed in terms of getting to the 170 as we anticipated. It certainly hasn't hasn't gone away. A couple of good things to note, I'd say well cost. And again, this applied to Oxy as, as well, but uh, encouraged by where not only their costs are today, but what they see as improvement opportunities. And so we'll be diving into that. And then, you know, looking at uh, some of the opportunities going forward, I think, remain, uh, you know, from a well performance perspective, I think the ability now to compare notes on things like well spacing and even the sequencing of how we develop these, um, uh, these stack pay, uh, we, we see opportunity. And so uh, that'll be a big part of what we're working through uh, for the rest of this year and next year. And then just scale uh, and efficiency. So we can quickly see opportunities, um, you know, as we think about a uh, rig and frat core utilization and, you know, uh, really that rolls into time to market improvements. And so as you are able to drive utilization of those resources up, we still see uh, time to market. Um, and then as Vicki mentioned, really the water management, we've been very proud of our water um, sort of management capabilities, but when we combine with a very strong position and, and frankly, more scale uh, with what the Crown Rock team has put together, I think that's going to deliver, um, you know, uh, cost synergies as well as operational synergy. So, um, so to sum it all up, you know, again, uh, excited to be with the team, uh, same opportunity, same upside, and just we're rolling it forward from where we start today. Um, and we're looking forward to providing more details as we go into the end of the year. The next question comes from Betty Jang with 
Barclays, please go ahead. Excuse me, Ms. Jang, your line is open. Oh, sorry, uh, I was on mute. Please go ahead. Um, hi, good afternoon. Sorry about that. Um, maybe I uh, want to switch gear a bit. I um, want to ask about the Stratos uh, project. Uh, really, uh, congratulations on signing the agreement with Microsoft um, this quarter. And um, want to get an update on where that project is today, um, the startup timing on that, and any t goal on what percentage of the carbon uh, uh, credits that you want to sell ahead of time. Um, and then, yeah, maybe start from there. Great, no, thanks for the question. We're um, excited uh, certainly with the Stratos project and the progress and I'll flip it to Ken after a few remarks to kind of give you more detail uh, on that. But I'd say generally uh, continue to see great progress in the business. Obviously the um, sales with Microsoft not only be the largest CDR kind of uh, block sale uh, to date, uh, but but really that, that counterparty meant a lot to us. We know they're uh, very diligent in the way they think about uh, what the product of a CDR can mean to their business, and you know it's just great constructive dialogue that ultimately rolls into the future market and and what that uh, product can deliver. So beyond just the monetary aspect of of that. Um, very pleased with that uh, outcome. I'd say the other thing I'd like to highlight, and I think again as we roll into Stratos next year and then uh, think about the future, continue to see great progress out of our carbon engineering um, R&D team. And so uh, as we think about the core elements of that process, being able to process air, uh, capture CO2 in our sorbent, liquid sorbent, and then you know, how do you efficiently release that and, and either sequester or use it, we're seeing some very innovative uh, things that we can see uh, direct line of sight to cost down, which is ultimately what we're trying to do uh, as we get into the development. Um, and so those are sort of the catalysts we're, we're paying too uh, closely to intentionally. I would say, you know, to your point, we'll continue to monitor uh, CDR sales. Um, we're, we remain very optimistic on the outlook of that market. We hadn't set any uh, specific uh, parameters in terms of uh, what that target is, um, you, you know, going forward. But uh, it'll it'll be a major component of our FID criteria for DAC too, for certain. Um, and so I think as we get closer to that, uh, you know, over the next um, you know period of time here, that we'll be able to give more disclosure of how we think about that from a from a commercial project to FID. So maybe with that, I'll I'll, I'll turn it over to Ken. Good afternoon, Betty. Um, overall, we remain on track for startup next summer. Uh, we currently have around 1,200 people at site, which is our peak. We'll start rolling off soon. Uh, we've been able to staff all trades as necessary, and Worley continues to do an excellent job. The efficiency of each of the trades is at or above where we expected them to be. We're now moving away from bulk fill, by that I mean putting in the large piping, cable, et cetera, into completing the systems one by one. So we're at that stage now so that we can commission in the right sequence. Uh, we get power live this month, which then means we can start getting the control room up and running and testing all of the instrumentation throughout of the plant. So they're going really well at the moment. We're also, as Richard highlighted, learning constantly during construction and also from the CEIC. We're seeing really great potential for per performance improvements and cost down improvements, and we're looking at how to incorporate these learnings as quickly as possible. Companies like Technip Energies are also focused on how to achieve cost down for their equipment, and that's driven from the top of the company. So we're getting great support from our visionary vendors who, who have bought into long-term DAC future. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you very much for that color. Um, maybe uh, shifting back to upstream, um, uh, a, a follow-up on the Rockies. Just um, after several quarters of very strong performance, 
uh, do you think that, and then third quarter guidance is also, again, uh, seeing sequential growth, but as activity is expected to slow down in the second half, we'd love to get some color on how you think about the production and activity trajectory going forward. Yeah, no, I appreciate that um, question. The Rockies has been a significant part of our outperformance, um, you know, really uh, over the last couple of years. So uh, a couple of things going on there. I think, you know, continue to do uh, well in the DJ uh, and the Powder River Basin. So, you know, as we highlighted, I think, in the slide, um, you know, each of those are seeing uh, sequential well performance improvement, even in the DJ where we've been more mature in terms of operation. And so, you know, very, very pleased with that. Um, from an activity standpoint, you know, we're, we, we really uh, have done work in the early part of this year in the Powder River Basin, uh, where, again, the well performance has been very good, not only against um, the industry, which we note, uh, but also against our internal expectations. And so um, what we're planning to do there is uh, we'll, we'll be lower activity in the second half of the year, uh, while we pause and really rework our development plans. And so similar to what we uh, kind of laid out generally in our highlight slide, we're really looking at how do you take uh, primary and secondary benches with, with uh, you know, the, the Turner and Nao and even the Maori and think about that longer term as we build out our infrastructure. And so what we're expecting is to be in position at the end of this year to you know, be able to uh, put together a development plan and then have that compete with capital uh, as we go into 2025. Um, so I think, you know, again, just very pleased with that, but I would call it steady activity in the in the DJ with a couple of rigs and then uh, really putting a competitive case forward for uh, forward uh, Powder River Basin in 2025. The next question comes from Paul Chang with Scotiabank. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I think the first one is uh, maybe for Shunil. Um, the I think you guys have said uh, you have uh, discussed with Echo Patrol uh, for the uh, for them that to um, purchase thirty percent undivided interest in the Crown Rock, uh, and then that fell apart. Uh, so from that standpoint, uh, what is the sticky point on that? And perhaps more importantly, uh, the reason why you uh, purchase Crown Raw must be you think the asset is uh, better or that at least uh, better than the average of your portfolio. So why that will be one of the first assets that you're trying to sell down? Uh, so trying to get some understanding uh, of the logic behind when you're initially talking to Echo Patrol for the deal. Uh, second question is that I know it's a little bit early for 2025 for capex and production, but can you give us some idea that uh, the um, maybe the moving part uh, plus and minuses uh, for next year uh, on both the capex and the production outlook? Thank you. Um, Paul, thank you for the question. Um, I'll take the I'll take the first question you you had, and um, I can tell you we absolutely believe that the Crown Rock assets um, as a combined um, asset is it is one of the best we've seen. Um, Tim um, Tim D Dunn did a great job of putting together the uh, the portfolio of assets that Crown Rock had, um, and they did a great job of developing it. And there's there's a lot of really good um, uh, possibilities in there for uh, for continued uh, expansion. And as you know, the inventory came in mostly in our tier one inventory. Uh, so the way that worked is that we wanted to buy 100% of Crown Rock, and I actually informed um, Echo Patrol on on numerous occasions that our preference was to purchase 100% of Echo, of uh, Crown Rock, but as a part of the Rodeo JV, we had an agreement with Echo Patrol within that um, that JV agreement that they had to write the right to purchase 49% of anything that we purchased within a certain area, and vice versa. If they were to purchase something, we would have had the right to buy 49% of what they had purchased within a given area within the Midland Basin. 
Um, so we wanted it all, but they also wanted to be a part of it. They saw the, the assets. They know they were high-quality assets. They wanted to be a part of it. Um, so since they are a valued partner to us, we've been, we've been uh, in partnerships with them uh, for decades, and we have a great relationship with them. So we negotiated to a 30% working interest that we felt like would, would be fair and beneficial to both of us. And we worked on that deal from March to just last week, and we thought we were done. But uh, President Petro of Columbia didn't approve of it. Uh, he And, you know, he's made it very clear to the world that he's anti-oil and gas, anti-fracking, and anti-U.S. And with those three, three strikes, he, he pretty much dealt the uh, Echo Patrol uh, out of the deal. And that's all um, according to news reports. But But certainly... Uh, we wanted it all. They wanted a, a part of it. Um, you know, unfortunately, there are others in the world like uh, like Petro, and um, and there are some in, actually in the United States like Petro who believe that oil and gas should go away and believe that um, that we shouldn't be um, an industry anymore, and that renewable energy will be all that's needed to um, to go forward um, and to uh, to help with the, the climate transition. But the reality is that, as you know, oil and gas is going to be needed for many decades to come. And so the other part of what Echo Patrol had had some interest in was our strategy. And um, our strategy in the Midland Basin with, with respect to CO2 and in enhanced oil recovery. And um, our, our strategy is very important to the world in that we're going to be taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and putting it in the assets that we have in the Midland Basin, including Crown Rock, to get more oil out of the ground, and so they were they were very excited about that and wanted to be a part of it. The next question comes from Doug Legate with Wolf Research. Please go ahead. Hi, this is John Abbott on for Doug Leggett. Yes, yeah, just sticking with um, Equi Patrol, Equi Patrol, Joe Joint Venture. How much production is associated with that JV? And, you know, just out of curiosity, if they did not want to continue in the Midland for some reason, would you be potentially interested in that asset? So the way that would work is that if, if we continued on beyond the, um, the ending of the uh, potential ending of the JV, the interest would just be divided um, 49% for Echo Patrol, 51% uh, for Oxy. So a discontinuation of the JV would just result in um, a couple of scenarios, one being if um, if we just broke it off, didn't go for it forward at all with the JV, we would each just have just like a normal uh, operating situation where it's 51% us, 49% them. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I was just sort of curious if you would be interested in that asset and just sort of curious as to how much production may be associated with that joint venture currently. I believe that's around 40,000 barrels a day. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's around 40. Okay. That's very helpful. And then for the second question, very quickly, what was the run rate spending at Crown Rock? It was, about, was it 900? Um, yeah, it, yeah, it's been very steady. I mean, I think we gave the guidance, you know, midpoint around 950, and it's been very steady with their five rigs. So uh, we looked at that, and, um, you know, I think that's part of their success. They've been able to be very uh, flat, which turns into a great production profile uh, as well. So so very, very, you can think about it very steady. Yeah, I just want to next, clarify on the Midland production. The 40,000 is our net production. The next question comes from John Royal with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, so my first question is on the asset sale program. Uh, to date, you've sold or agreed uh, to sell about a billion dollars worth of assets. Um, is there anything you can offer on the lost cash flow uh, you expect from these assets? Uh, we, we know the production impact from Barilla Draw, but I was just wondering on the cash flow side if there's anything you can give us there. Uh, we can't yet because we really haven't made decisions on what the next um, set of divestitures would be. 
we're still under evaluation of that. Okay, yeah, I was just referring to the billion that you've already announced. But um, okay, so uh, the, my follow up is just on the the DAC program. Um, maybe you can talk about how it's uh, developing, kind of looking past uh, Stratos. Um, are you in serious or, or advanced discussions with potential partners and or licensees uh, for future DACs, or do you expect that those discussions would ramp once you, once you have sort of a, a proof of concept out there with Stratos being uh, uh, operational? Just try and understand how you expect the program to evolve uh, post-Stratos. Yeah, maybe answer that uh, um, kind of yes to both. I think, um, you know, one thing we've done is, you know, with the King Ranch uh, sequestration hub, we continue to develop that. Uh, we're pursuing really across all of our sequestration hubs in the Gulf Coast our, um, you know, stratigraphic wells that prove the subsurface storage capability. We're going through permitting for Class six wells. And so we've really put, you know, that, that sort of uh, front-end work together to be able to accommodate uh, both direct air capture and our uh, point source. And that that continues to go well. Um, you know, King Ranch is really what we've targeted for the next uh, kind of uh, development beyond the Permian, and it really has a lot of scale advantages that we've talked about in the past, both with the subsurface and, you know, as we think about it, the balance of plants. You think about um, key power inputs, emissions-free power inputs, water, or other, other advantages. And so that sort of engineering work uh, we continue to do for South Texas as it relates to the subsurface and DAC. Uh, but um, yes to your first part of the question, which is we do think it's really uh, important to see uh, Stratos as we continue to show that this great line of sight on cost down, uh, both in Stratos and the construction and then as it turns into operations next year, and also how we think about the Carbon Engineering Innovation Center and the R&D improvements that Ken and I talked about earlier roll in. And so we do feel like from a, um, you know, from a milestone going into next year, getting um, you know, this plan online, uh, we're able to incorporate some of these learnings already uh, into that process as we uh, begin uh, ramping up that capacity next year. We think that's a really important thing to factor into that South Texas FID in addition to the, the continued CDR sales that, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and the last thing to say, you know, the, the exciting part about that King Ranch development, that's really, you know, a 30 million ton uh, per year hub. And so you get these tremendous economies of scale that we really think add uh, to the R&D improvements in terms of a cost down. And so that that's really how we see that play out. If you go back to our early sort of presentations on a development plan uh, into the next decade, that's that's a big part of that ramp up. So uh, let me stop there, and hopefully that answered um, some of the intent of your question. The next question comes from Roger Reed with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, and uh, good afternoon. Um, I guess I'd kind of like to come at the, the question on the cash returns. Um, you know, comments were made in the presentation on the catch-up calls uh, yesterday. You know, get the debt paid down and then get back to um, buying back shares, potentially even, you know, go after retiring the preferred. And I'm just curious kind of how you're looking that at that in terms of what you would want to do um, once the, the balance sheet's where you want it. Meaning, do you want to get all the way back to buying back the preferred again, or does it make sense to be a little more um, steady with the share repos, raise the dividend, and then leave yourself the flexibility for um, acquisitions? It really depends on the macro because what we're doing today with this accretive um, acquisition to me is it is actually delivers better value than buying back shares. So given that's that's why we we did the deal we did. Um, but share repurchases still is a part of our uh, value proposition, and especially given the the fact that our share price is so much lower than than we believe uh, where it should be. So so as we get through this period and we get our debt down back down to 15 billion we will then resume share repurchases 
And, um, and it really depends on the macro at that point. If we are in a scenario where we can buy enough shares back to uh, trigger the $4 per share, then we would start um, also buying back to preferred. That would be a part of, of what we do. Uh, we can't ever uh, rule out, um, you know, the you know, what the um, the situation would be if we were in a prolonged um, high uh, high price environment. Because I think that although the the Berkshire Preferred becomes um, available to us at a five percent rather than ten percent. Uh, premium uh, starting in uh, 2029. So that, if we haven't bought it back by then, we would definitely launch a campaign at that point to to buy the preferred. Yeah, right. The the 10 year kind of change. Okay. Right. And right. then, as an unrelated follow up, just your um, guidance on the midstream business and the gas trading. Uh, what? What is the expectation that you have on Matterhorn in terms of startup that's that's built into your expectations? Is that middle of the quarter, end of the quarter? I'm just trying to understand, like maybe upside downside to the to the guidance. That would probably um, happen mid to late quarter. Is is the last update that we've had? The next question comes from Neil Dingman with Truist Securities. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. My, um, my first question, Vicki, is just on the Gulf of Mexico. Specifically, could you give some colors how active you might be with tiebacks through the remainder of the year? I think you've got a lot of opportunities there. And then maybe even, you know, look at all the exploration opportunities. I'm just, you know, given all these opportunities you have, do you anticipate a bit more startups there on, on the exploration side starting next year? You know, the exploration, it won't be as aggressive as it's been in the past because of the fact that we've launched a an evaluation uh, using uh, data analytics and AI. And what we want to do is, is give our teams the tools that we believe will help even further understand what's happening in the subsurface of the very complex deep water uh, prospects within the Gulf of Mexico. But the exciting thing is we have and numerous other things that we can do in the Gulf of Mexico that uh, that Ken can describe. Thanks, Vicki. I think overall the teams are performing really well on all fronts. Um, the base, including primary exploration and the water flood designs. On the base, for example, as a result of recent OBN seismic data, we moved further northwest of one of our fields and brought on a 15,000 barrel a day well, which came on in early May. From further analysis of the OBN data, we're seeing more potential in that area and others. In exploration, we're currently involved in two recent discoveries in Gaul, Ocotillo and Tiberias. Ocotillo, Ocotillo can tie back to Marlin, Tiberias to Lucius. These are like Three and a half mile to eight mile tiebacks. Both projects are going through our process to FID at the moment, and we can discuss more after sanction. We're continuing our water flood project designs. We'll be capable of commencing execution next year. These have the potential to add substantial low cost reserves, and these projects are in our wheelhouse as a company where water flood is one of our strengths. And operationally, we've safely completed all our major turnarounds for the year, so very positive overall in GOM as we lean into the AI pilots that Vicky highlighted earlier. Great update. And then um, just a second on OFS services. I'm just wondering, are you seeing any, given sort of the recent volatility or maybe downturn, a little bit downturn in oil, have you seen any recent softness and just wondered how different prices, OFS prices, might be trending onshore versus offshore. Let, let, let me just start, and then Ken can uh, provide uh, some better detail. I just wanted to uh, make mention, uh, certainly see an improvement in overall uh, capital efficiency or well cost or, or facilities, and we wanted to highlight that in the slide, mainly because the teams have really been engaged this year, um, you know, upfront. Uh, improving operations, but also engaging with our service contractors to find how do we drive utilization up and how do we uh, create this sustained um, kind of uh, program. So we highlighted the, 
the 10 percent uh year to date on well costs which we think is a tremendous value add as you roll that into 2025 in addition to the opex improvements that vicky highlighted but let me let me stop there i just want to say thank you to the teams and turn it over to ken yeah, same, same as Richard, you know, onshore U.S. from a supply chain perspective, we see deflation continuing. Uh, between, say, last summer and the end of this year, we see north of 10% rolling through in our drilling and completion basket. We also see OCTG significantly higher than that in terms of deflation, which also benefits, you know, all the other functions. We see continued focus by the contractors to improve efficiency and technology, so e-fleets, autofrac, they're really pushing the, the technology aspects and they're working with us, us on utilization. And it's not only the efficiency that comes with utilization, but because of the planning that Richard's teams are doing, it releases those contractors to use that equipment in the spaces we're not, so they can maximize their margins also. Having mass matters, so Crown Rock will enable more value in that space in the Midland Basin, so it's definitely accretive. So that answers the question. The next question comes from David Deckelbaum with TD Cowan. Please go ahead. Afternoon, Vicki and team. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, I was curious if I could ask a little bit more just on the Crown Rock progression into next year. I think you all still are standing by getting towards that 170,000 a day target and then perhaps growing it from there. So when we think about CapEx for next year, given that this was a high graded transaction, do you see the Crown Rock assets sort of thieving some capital from some areas that you were spending money on in 24? Um, as we think about that program, and I guess in part of that, uh, is, is there some savings on the CapEx side associated with selling Barilla Draw? Um, I would say that we would keep the same activity level with uh, Crown Rock uh, going into next year. They've had this, as Richard said earlier, this same activity level for quite a while. It's worked well for them. And we think that with the capability of our teams working together, that we'll actually be able to maybe do more with less. And so we think that's that's going to be a good news story. So likely no increase in activity in Crown Rock. And the um, uh, Brilla Draw, part of the reason that we divested in Brilla Draw is because we weren't investing capital there because we had um, development going on in other areas that was taking the capital away from Brilla Draw. And so... Our philosophy has always been if, um, if we have an asset that doesn't compete for capital and or uh, would have competed under different circumstances, but we're not going to get to it for five to ten years, then uh, that's that's why we do the best of it. I appreciate the color there. Um, and then maybe my second question is just on direct air capture, just following Stratos. I know... There was some enthusiasm, especially last year, around ADNOC and their interest in direct air capture. You know, would you characterize most of your conversations with most parties at this point as sort of being in a wait and see mode around Stratos and how you know some of these first projects perform? I would say there's a lot of interest in Stratos, and it's it's now. I think about every conference around the world and companies around the world are, are all talking about Stratos. In fact, we had a major uh, operator, um, had an international operator come and visit our site because there's a lot of interest in it. But as, um, as Richard said, first of all, we want to get it up and running and um, because we believe that, that as we prove it up, as we make it better, that it's going to be uh, much more valuable than what people realize today. And Richard, did you have something to add? No, I just think that's right. I mean, I think uh, we continue to talk, you know, our ambitious plans. We think that there's uh, a lot of scale in terms of development. You've seen, you know, some of our development plans. And so as we prove it, as we give line of sight to cost down, uh, we're very confident that both strategic and capital partners are going to have an investable um, you know, development to, that will be able to help us. So that is our strategy. But I mean, we're we're doing a lot of engagement on multiple fronts, both from offtake and uh, future capital partnerships. So um, appreciate that question. 
In the interest of time, this concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Vicki Holub for any closing remarks. I'd just like to say thank you all for your questions and have a great rest of your day. The conference has now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.